Time to catch up with Michael Tulip. Happy birthday, Michael Tulip. How are you, man? I'm 30. Um, <laughs> How do you feel? But I'm good. I feel like I'm in my athletic prime, which is, right. which is great. This is the peak, Mike. This is what you've been looking forward to the entire time. I'm just time. now hitting my stride, man. Facial hair is still awful, but we're getting there. I don't think I'll ever – I'll never be one of these. I don't think that's, that's yeah. possible, but uh, we're getting there, man. Yeah, that's never been a problem for me. I was growing this out at like age 20. So uh, then it fell out on top. So uh, that might be yeah, the it's better. Gotta go somewhere, man. You're just, yeah. you're just reallocating. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, Mike, uh, Marcus Domas certainly hit his peak uh, against F FAU. What, what a phenomenal performance. 33 points. Illinois, huge, impressive win as he and Shannon each score 33 points, both career highs. We got to start with Marcus Domask. I think we saw a little bit of a breakthrough against Rutgers. Got him going a little bit. I mean, he's been good against really good opponents. Yeah. Uh, the low majors, not so much. Uh, but I, I know you didn't have a lot of concerns. But what do you think led to this performance for Marcus Domask? Well, it was just to put the performance into context. The, the graphics showed on the screen. But, I mean, when you're talking about a top two, and Terrence is in there too, um, a top two scoring output in the Jimmy V Classic, that is – that's insane because you think about the 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 teams that get invites to that tournament are elite teams oh, yeah. most times. It's a very small field, and, and those games are, are typically great games with great opponents. So that alone is impressive. But but it is it is incredible for a few more reasons too. I, I mentioned the stage, right? Uh, the opponent. That's an opponent in FAU. I mean, what would they possibly be scared of? Coming into, I mean, after what they did in the tournament last year, how they've performed in these high pressure type of games, and they've typically in the past just with their toughness and strength, they've bullied people, and that's just you know Davis, uh, Elijah Martin. That's that's what they do. They back down guys and get into the pain, and you gave them a taste of their own medicine. But the the last part that I'll mention and why that performance was so incredible, the efficiency. I, I mean. Him getting the 33 points on 9 of 21 shooting and shooting 10 free throws is a lot different than 15 of 21 and having two guys score 33 and having it be completely additive, like completely additive. And uh, so we'll, we'll dive into it a bit more, but the, the last point or the really two more points I want to make about the mask, he was feeling himself. And, and I, I, I will give you one instance where I knew he was feeling himself and it's not when he was doing too small or Jordan shrug or shaking his head after he's making shots. Those are obvious, right? That's when you can see a player and be like, yeah, he, he feels like he's got it going. It was 76, 68. Damask takes a not great three early in the shot clock. Davis comes down, hits a long one, 76, 71. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, ah, oh, I don't. I hope Marcus doesn't all of a sudden become gun shy. Literally, the next possession, he's like, "F it." They go under again, and he he steps right back for three and drains it. So, and, and then you know the, the point that I want to make to tie this all together is that he has a responsibility with his talent and his skill level. You have a responsibility, game in and game out, for your team and for yourself. And if you don't believe in yourself or you have this kind of timid nature, like we've seen against some of these go figure, you know, mid-major, low-major teams, that's doing your team a disservice. And I'm not even saying that in a way that's hard on the kid, but that's the responsibility you take on as a really good player. Terrence Shannon, you know, think about the Penn State game last year at mm -hmm. home. Terrence was awful. And, and look what it did to the team. So that's, you know, everyone says they want to be that guy. But this is how you prove it on a nightly basis. And it's not always going to be 15 for 21 from the field, 33 points. But that mindset of no one can guard me out here and I'm still going to make the right play and do the right thing, that that goes that goes a long way for this team. There's no question. Speaking of Terrence Shannon, uh, Mike, last year we talked about, man, this guy is so good. Sometimes does he realize it? he needs to be the alpha, needs to assert himself. He has done that. And now if you can get Domask, 33 is not going to happen maybe once more this season, right? But if you can get Damask giving you 15 plus most nights or or frequently, what does that do for, for Terrence Shannon if Domask can be that regular second option? Yeah, I, well, we talked about it 
the weeks leading up to that game. So for Terrence, I, I was worried, and I've said it on this podcast before, I was worried that he was going to run himself into the ground yeah, trying to carry this load. I, I was really worried about that because his health – is priority one for this team. I, I don't. I don't care what anyone says, and I think it's it's obvious, but it still needs to be stated. But the flurry that Marcus went on in that in that second half. I mean, he was he was good in the first half, but in the second half in particular, it's like FAU's guarding him has no idea what to do with him, and then all of a sudden, kind of lying in wait is Terrence freaking Shannon, and then he kind of drops the anvil at the end of the game and takes guys off the dribble and ones and just absolutely broke their spirit. And that tandem is so important because not only just on the offensive side of the ball, but Marcus is good defensively. He uses his strength. He can move his feet. He levels you off. He is not just surviving on the defensive end and is just this offensive talent. He And, and that helps Terrence too. Because we've talked about it before, and I want to shout out Ty Rogers. Ty Rogers has been incredible on that end. But you don't want Terrence to feel like he has to guard the best player every night in addition to carrying this offensive load. And the last point that I'll make is all these teams prepare. Big Ten teams, non-conference, they all prepare. You don't want 98% of the scouting report to be Terrence Shannon. Yeah. You don't want 98% of what scout team is doing taking away Terrence Shannon's left hand and, hey, this action, we want to blow this up here. Can you divert some attention away from Terrence Shannon for teams that are prepping? And Marcus is doing that. And that 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 is going to help Terrence, one, be able to play within himself more and not feel like he has to shoulder that and, and take over every single second. Uh, and that's that's huge. That's huge for this team. That's huge for, for both Marcus and Terrence. Uh, and I'm excited to see them continue to be consistent with that. Uh, Cause there's a lot of things that I think have contributed to, to them getting to this point. This is probably the two back to back on the East coast here. The, the two best offensive games we've basically seen uh, for, from Illinois and, and the stat I'll bring up, Mike, the last five games, Illinois has averaged 42, two point attempts, 23 threes. First three games, Illinois averaged 31 twos, 27 threes, almost even there. Uh, what's changed? Is that the biggest change? What have you seen about why the offense has been effective the last couple of games? Just, besides just Marcus Domas going on a heater. Well, I, it's the the change has been twofold. There's a mind there's been a mindset change and there's been a schematic change. The mindset shift has been, hey, every single possession we are not letting you off the hook. Now there's been times certain times throughout the game where they'll they'll shoot it a three early, of course, but yeah. you can tell that the identity and that there's been this concerted effort to get to the paint first. That's not always through a paint touch or a post entry but can we just say man we are putting pressure on you regardless of if you pressure us in the back court if you come at us in the half court i mean we're we are just that is what we are doing period now the schematic change is that i think the scheme has been a little bit more deliberate there they they have proper spacing and when i say proper spacing that comes down to who is spacing where and there was a great like all 22 look that they did in Madison Square Garden when Marcus was isolating up top. They happened they happened to do it during the game, like almost like when you shift on NBA Live or NBA 2K and you, you shift the view. And it was a perfect look because you had Marcus dribbling the ball up top. And the change that they've made is that they're now putting Coleman Hawkins in the corner and Ty Rogers is in the corner. So if those two guys are up on the wing, which a lot of times you want to enter it to Coleman Hawkins and have him play as this hub, which they still do at times. But, hey, if we space Coleman to the corner, now if the two guys on the wings are Terrence Shannon and Luke Goody, those gaps are a little wider. Mm -hmm. And now these guys can operate and vice versa, right? Terrence Shannon has the ball. Marcus Damask is spacing on the wing. So where they've put these guys is equally as important to just simply – as opposed to just like having spacing. And then the other thing that I'll mention too is – They've been very – you can tell we'll break it down on the film, of course. Uh, but they've been very deliberate with the pieces that they have and what they want to run. So instead of just doing, hey, they did some zoom action stuff where they'll enter it to Coleman, guy cuts over the top, sets a down screen, down screen into a handoff. That stuff is good, and they'll still run some of that. But they've, they're implementing some more like role replace actions. So I know this is video, So I've, and if anyone's listening – if anyone's listening on a podcast, I'm going to try to break this down as the best that I can. But picture 
you know, you have your action that you go to to initiate the offense, and then eventually it is a Coleman Hawkins. You have Terrence Shannon in the right corner, okay? Coleman Hawkins comes up and sets a screen for Marcus Damask to come off with his right hand. As he's coming off with his right hand, Terrence has now made his way under the basket, and there's a roll replace action. So we talked about Coleman weeks ago. We're like, Coleman needs to start sprinting out of, not just popping every time, sprinting to the on the rolls. They're doing that. Mm-hmm. Coleman is rolling to the basket, and simultaneously, as he rolls, Terrence is coming up to the top of the key. So picture Marcus Damask off with his right hand, Coleman rolling, Terrence coming off the roll replace. When you throw back, you may have Coleman on the roll, but when you throw back to Terrence, what's Terrence doing? He's catching it, and it's a right hand, it's a left hand drive on the single side with with you know maybe it's Goody in that corner. Yeah, uh, that's the shift that needs to happen because sometimes they have Rogers in that corner, and the, the tag man is way too far into the paint. So if they put a shooter into that paint, now you got Terrence option to Terrence, okay? Or that low tag man is worried about the roll. And then they're also worried about chasing Terrence and it's going to free up that skip pass to the other side. So you see where I'm going here. There are just so many options to play out of it. And you have guys that can make sound decisions too. And then they have, you know, when they really want to simplify things, which is what they're doing too. It doesn't have to be complex when they simplify things. I mean, some of those baskets were just dribble the ball up the floor, use your body and score. Right. Yeah. Just I I was going through, I put some stuff into the film, but I'm also like, I don't need to, to like analyze this too deep. This is a guy who has a size advantage and is putting you on his hip and going and scoring. Yeah. And sometimes that's how that's how simple it has to be. But the other action that they're running too is kind of this pistol action where you'll see if Marcus Damask is dribbling up the left side of the floor, and they did this and they like a matchup. You got I think uh, Greenlee for for FAU guarding Justin Harmon. Justin Harmon comes up and sets a pistol screen from the corner. Right, I'm I'm, I'm dribbling up to the left wing. Now he comes up and sets almost like a reverse ball screen, gets that switch, and hey, it's clear out. Back mm-hmm. down, let's go. And and that that is what they've been trying to work towards. Now they're doing it. Now how disciplined can you be in a ruckus environment in Knoxville? And and can you stay, yeah. can you stay the course? Right. And if they do that, they're they're gonna be a really efficient offense because they're gonna be shooting less threes and they're getting way more shots around the hoop. They were really disciplined with that. I thought they were really yeah. disappointed. Of course, like Brad Underwood talked about booty ball. He's got a booty ball guy. Uh, maybe multiple. If Ty Rogers can improve his game, Justin Harmon, if he gets uh, smaller guys on him. But Coleman Hawkins' impact the last two games, I think, has been so apparent, Mike. Uh, I, I know FAU scored 89 points, but when he's on the court, the defense is just different. Vlad Golden's a, a tough matchup. But what have you seen? Uh, what is his impact? What, have, what has played out the last two games with Coleman back? We've been talking about this for years, man. Um, it, I know it's not always perfect with Coleman. There's some things that can be frustrating. All of us can, can probably say that. And, and, but, but no, no player is perfect. And I think I, I put out the clip on Twitter yesterday. Uh, you can stick around for the film room cause it's, it's in there as well. But that, I just wanted to highlight, those are the little IQ things that he does an early box out on Vlad Golden to steal a possession, make two free throws. And that pretty much put the game away. And, then he has all these all these little things he's doing offensively and defense. It's he's a kind of around the fringes guy, mm-hmm. but you need that type of guy. That guy is like the glue to your team, and he allows you to play a certain way. When I talk about spacing Coleman to the corner, Coleman hasn't been shooting it particularly well, but there's still somewhat of a threat there. He's a guy that's hit six threes in a game before, six right. seven threes in a game before. Um, if you stick Dane in that corner. You, that guy's planted right in the middle of the paint. So that's what you can do with Coleman. And then I, I just I want to point out the the growth from Coleman as well. I, he is is starting to recognize a little bit of, of who he is. I think Coleman's a good shooter. It, they haven't fallen this yeah. year, but he hits a massive, 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 massive three to make it 89-84. They come back and hit one, 89-87. And Damas comes off with his right hand and gets that same exact look, throwback to Coleman. Last year, or maybe two years ago, Coleman shoots that again. And it, like it wasn't a clean catch. It was the pass was a little bit low, and he was still able to just say, Hey, time situation, let's go into a dribble handoff. And that possession ended up playing out, and it led to him getting 
that offensive rebound and, and the foul. And so that's, those are the things that, that you just, you just love from him. And uh, Taryn Shannon was a massive, uh, it was a massive deal that Taryn Shannon came back this year. There's no question, but there's part of the reason why everybody was so fired up that Coleman was coming back too, because Coleman helps Terrence. I mean, it is, he helps this team so much. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm excited for him to, to get fully healthy as well. I think he's, I think he's battling a little bit oh, out yeah. there, but, but that's, that's, that's what you want to see from a guy that, that has been around the block and is, is willing to, uh, to sacrifice a bit for his team. Domas settled into his role. We know Gary A seems really comfortable in his role. Wasn't a great game against FAU, but uh, the other emerging storyline here is Justin Harmon on the East Coast. Two games, 42 minutes, 17 points, Mike. And he did it efficiently, making all three of his threes. That's not going to continue to happen. But, like, he looks settled in. How, how do you see that? Well, we talked about an emergence from either Harmon or Dre Gibbs. Like, someone had to do it. Dre Gibbs, Allhorn, Harmon, it, it had to be someone. And, and it's been Justin. And – you mentioned settling into his role. This is a new role for Justin Harmon. I'm not sure Justin Harmon has literally ever played this type of role in his life. And you could see that early in the season. It's kind of hesitant. Where do I go? Usually I kind of have the ball in my hands and it's more, it's easier to kind of dictate where you're going to be on the floor possession by possession. Now he's, he's a, Hey, corner space, relocate threes, corner threes, pursue it on the offensive glass, be a pest defensively. He seems to be settling into that. And you could say this for Quincy and Justin. I watch them. I, I'm not there. I'm not in the locker room. I'm not there at shoot around. I, they their attitude is just phenomenal. I watched last year, right? And like last year was, oh, look at these guys that are even keel. And then it was like early season, like, are you even keel? Or are you just like kind of like apathetic? Or I don't, I don't know what the what the the body language is definitely different now when you win two games like this i mean we'll see if they lose a game and they have a couple a bad stretch that's kind of when it turned last year but yeah I, you can read. Well, I'll, I'll say i'll say this Harmon, i think was maybe dealing with a, a different type of role I'm, I'm not saying he had he had bad body language early on he looked a little bit more like quiet on the bench early in the yeah. season quincy has not changed at all no bad shooting you know i just he is he just looks like a ball of joy out there and that 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 does so much because we know that Coleman can be kind of like high strung sometimes in games. And like Quincy just seems to kind of level him out a little bit. And that's, that's huge. And, and I think this is the role when you look at Harmon, this is the role we kind of envisioned for him. I think we talked about this in the off season. It's like, Hey, you're a come in off the bench. Don't think you're not a multi read guy. You're a single read. And that's not a bad thing. Catch and shoot opportunistic attacks, pest, you know, you know, pesky on the offensive glass and a pest on defense. That's your role. And he's, he's figuring that out. And and if he, and if he's consistent with that and he doesn't get the, the Pat Riley disease of more, <laughs> or you're like, ah, I just, well, I did this. Now I need this. Like if guys stay, if guys stay consistent with their roles, man, this, this team's going to do some things for sure. Speaking of roles, what do you think the coaching staff is telling Dane danger right now after couple struggles, especially against FAU. It's tough, right? Because we've, we've seen success from Dane, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, this is a really good Illinois basketball team. And this, this happens everywhere you go on elite teams. There's someone that always, I'm talking always pretty much hundred percent of the time. There's someone that always is going to feel like I could probably be getting more minutes or man, I'm not getting the opportunity or, Hey, my performance is the, is the, re like, I can't get into a rhythm because I'm not playing enough. And that's why I'm not performing in these, in these stretches, these 11 minutes that he had at FAU. It just, there was some good in there. It wasn't, it wasn't all bad, but just, just little things to where we talk about the, you know, he kind of gets this, uh, I don't know, like you, you pull your hair out a little bit. Cause it's like, he wants to make things happen the second he gets the ball in the post. I'll show it in the film, but the second the ball got entered to him, this FAU assistant coach stands up and points at the guy ball side and is like, go, run at it, run at it. Like he's going to put the ball on the ground. Yeah. And he goes and he dribbles and he tries to spin and it ends up being a turnover. And, you know, and then even in another turnover he had in the first half, he just, he caught it at the elbow 
He had a guy in the slot right in front of him, and then he had a guy in the corner. Like, there was no spacing for him to operate, and he's still, like, quick spin, dribble into the – to, like, the crowded side. And so it just I, – I, it's hard. I, I'm, I can't even sit here and be like, man, Dane, come in and be perfect because it's it's – it's an imperfect situation because right. you you aren't getting as many minutes, so it's hard to get in a rhythm, and it's just less is more with with him. And but how how you talk through that, or I don't know, you're winning, and it's like if you if you've developed a good culture and you have good guys in that locker room, that makes it a little bit easier for a guy like that to swallow, you know, to, to swallow that. And and I I know I see him on the bench and. He seems to be standing up, and I see him in the locker room post game and all that. Now there are a lot of other hours that are spent outside of the bench right. and the locker room, but you you just you hope that he's seeing the big picture and understanding. Man, this is a team that has a chance to do a lot of things this year, um, some big things, and he has a chance to be a part of that. It may not be as big as he thought, but still a chance to be a part of it. And also, if things break down and he's counted on, you still got to be ready. You can't, that, you it reminds can't, me, it reminds yeah. me, Mike, of junior year Georgie. Like, yeah. All of a sudden, Kofi and Grandison are getting all those minutes, but there's gonna be games they need him. Like they're like Coleman's yeah. gonna be in foul trouble, or you know, maybe Coleman's hurting or not playing well. But they're gonna need Dane Danger, so he's got to be ready. And Georgie had some some frustrating games, but also some some really big games that, that we can remember against what Iowa uh was it yeah. uh, in, the, in the Big Ten tournament? Like so I, I feel like if he accepts that, like you're saying, you, you just gotta be ready, uh, you gotta be locked in. Well, I think Coleman's a great example of this. You know, Coleman's sophomore year, they, you know, they play Wisconsin pretty much like a, a month and a half maybe before they clinch the Big Ten title against Iowa. And Coleman Hawkins played two minutes. Mm -hmm. But he stayed ready, and then you, pl you play that game against, against Iowa to clinch, and he plays 37 minutes and has nine points and ten rebounds. Yeah. So – you 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 have a guy that you can potentially lean on in that in that situation, or if you're Coleman, you're like pulling him aside. Hey man, just be ready, and and things just things just work out. I've never I've never been in a situation where I'm like, hey, if you have a bad attitude or if you're upset with your role, if that tends to persist, things typically don't work out the way that you you want them to work out. There's just there's a bigger picture at hand, and you just kind of hope that Dane sees that and buys into that. You've heard us talk about home field apparel since the start of the season. There are a lot of collegiate apparel brands out there, but we wanted to partner with home field because their designs are the best out there. Some of Illini Enquirer's favorites are the basketball ringer tee, the rose tee, and the 1980s long sleeve with the script Illini. It's great. Be sure to check out homefieldapparel.com, filter by Illinois, and see what we're talking about. And our listeners get an exclusive deal using code Illini23. Using that code Illini23 gets you 15 percent off your first order we all know you're wearing a line eye gear so if you need of a refresh we really think that you should check out home field apparel which has the best designs and these shirts guys are really comfortable their designs are super unique and a lot of thought goes into each concept there's really nothing else on the market like what home field is doing you can find them at homefieldapparel.com and use code align 23 for 15 percent off your first order at homefieldapparel.com this episode of the Illini Enquirer podcast is presented by Underdog Sports. We see a lot of you are downloading Underdog Sports, using the promo code, and having fun, which we love to see. If you haven't already checked out Underdog Sports, be sure to do so. It's super easy to use. You go on the app, go pick whether favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total than what is listed. For example, Travis Kelsey, he's very popular these days. If his number is set at 50 receiving yards, and you know Taylor Swift is in the house, you may feel confident he's going to go way higher than the number. Do that with two to five different players and you're in business if you go five for five you can 20x your money so sign up today with promo code Illini and get your first deposit doubled up to $100 visit underdogfantasy.com or find them in the app store and don't forget to register with promo code Illini to get your first deposit doubled up to $100 there are a lot of fantasy companies out there but we decided to partner with underdog because it's the easiest place to play fantasy sports it's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry you must be 18 or older and present in a state where underdog fantasy operates terms apply concerned with your play call 1-800-522-4700 or visit www.ncpgambling.org Florida Atlantic was actually pretty good in this game that's what makes this win <laughs> even more impressive um and in Florida Atlantic I mean 
scored 89 points. It was the worst defensive efficiency of the year for Illinois. But, Mike, I, I thought they bothered FAU, especially early in this game. What did you make of the, the defensive performance? You got a historical offensive performance from two of your best players, and it almost didn't matter. That's that's that was stunning. When when you talk about how efficient Illinois was and what they're what we know they're capable of defensively, and to look at that game and be like, it is 89-87 yeah. with with a minute 57 left. This is insane. The thought of potentially wasting that performance, I don't even want to say wasting, but not being able to pull out a win, that would have been it would have been like Tennessee ruining a 37 point night from Dalton Connect against North Carolina, right? A hundred percent. And 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 also it's just like as as hard as that would have been to swallow for Illinois, equally you just gotta you had to tip your cap to FAU, man. I mean, they that is that is a team that I, I would be shocked if they lost more than five games this year, and they've already lost two. Right. So they just they have it everywhere. They their guard play and ability to shoot the ball and they have one of the better bigs in, um, you know, certainly in mid-major basketball, but he's he's a high major player. I mean, he's a he's a high major transfer in Golden, and so and it's then kind you look awesome, at kind of awesome, Mike. They've they've played two teams I can see in the Final Four. Yeah, no question. It's awesome. Mar- yeah, Marquette and FAU. I, I think are two teams that can make it there. Tennessee has a chance. You say they more coming. Yeah, if things shake out the right way, that they can do it. And look, FAU, I say you held them to one point oh three points per possession because it was a high possession game everybody looks at you can look at the 89 points that was a higher possession game than the Marquette game and Marquette paid plays this like you know feverish Mm -hmm. tempo um you know so that was I think the that was FAU's third lowest you know points per possession of the season and Illinois did that um and was still able to to pull out that I mean Illinois was 1.25 and and that this still a really good FAU team defensively so it's encouraging to see that this Illinois team can play a different type of styled game where it's like, Hey, 164 possessions in a game and we can keep up. It's a lot. You not only keep up, we can score almost a hundred points. And granted there was a, there was a very efficient 98 points, but that you didn't make 14 threes. That's, right. that was one of my takeaways from this game was if you told me that Illinois put up 98 points, told me in the beginning of the season, Illinois is going to put up 98 points against FAU in Madison Square Garden, I would have said, how many threes they hit? Because just like the UCLA game last year, everybody's celebrating the UCLA game. I'm like, I don't think Terrence is going eight for nine from three the rest of the season. Yeah, and I don't know if 15 for 21 is sustainable, right? Like, Domas, it probably isn't going to score 33 again, but, Mike, the way they got it. The looks. felt way different than UCLA or even Texas last year. Like that, yeah. So yeah. Do, do you feel like this is a different kind of win than, than last year? Do we take more out of it? Should we – should Illinois fans feel more encouraged about this one than the two huge wins they had last year? It's a loaded question. And I'll give you, I'll give you a few different answers to that, um, or I'll, I'll take it in a few different directions. One, it's different because it felt like you were never out of it. Uh, you felt like you were out of it against UCLA and Texas last year. Yeah. You happen to surge back and, and steal both of those games. You're down 15 to UCLA, you're down 12 to Texas. And that was like the story for that team mm-hmm. throughout the year. It was like, well, here's Northwestern at home and down 19. All right, well, let's charge our way back again. It was exhausting. Yeah. And this game, right, like the way, where you are getting your looks is way more replicable than, you know, last year where it was like, hope we hit some threes. Step back, Terrence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Matthew Meyer, step back. Oh, okay. Wow, that went in. Like there were too many of those looks last year where it was like, oh, oh okay, okay, thank God. That, you know, Tuesday night was like, Man, they if they if they're patient enough, they'll get they won't get all those types of looks, but they'll get a lot of them, and, and they'll be able to be a, a very efficient offense. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I, there were people calling in on radio after the game and stuff. Well, you know, this is what they did last year. I'm like, does it feel different to you? Yes. Watching this team and last year's team, does it feel different to you? Do you feel like when you're watching this team, as a viewer, is there a little bit more trust? Like, do you feel like, hey, late game? Oh my, you're not like. I mean, FAU made it tough, obviously. Sure. But you're not sitting there going like, who's going to take the tough one? Who's going to take the tough shot? Who's going to potentially turn it over? Like when the ball's in Marcus Damask's hands, Terrence Shannon's hands, you just feel like, ah, oh, there's comfort there. There's comfort there. And then to me, that's that's all you need to know. The difference between last year and this year is that you just have a little, you have, it's more, you have more experience for sure, mm-hmm. but you have guys that have been around the block 
And then they, they, you can see it in their eyes. You can see it on their faces late game. There's just, there's no panic. And that that's the difference. Well, Mike, a hell of a start to December, uh, two and zero to start this thing. And now, Hey, here's another one. Huge opportunity at Tennessee. feels like this uh, past week and a half has already been a success because of, of getting two. But now you have a chance to to get greedy, man, and, and go steal a, another quad one. I would say quad one AA uh, kind of win on the road here against Tennessee. So, what do you think of this matchup, and, and what's this game mean for the Illini? Yeah, well, I was inter- interested to see how they, you know, reacted after the Rutgers win, playing against an FAU team that wants to just bully you and out tough you, and that game was set up for you to come out there lethargic and. Be like, man, we're one and zero in Big Ten play. Got a big road win, and now we play this mid-major FAU. Um, so that was encouraging. And now, now you got to do it again. And I think some of the some of the things that you're hearing out of press conferences, Damas, Terrence Shannon, they won that game on Tuesday night, but it wasn't like it was their Super Bowl. And I think they they truly are like, I think Damas said it. He's like, I, we didn't we I, I didn't come here. We didn't we didn't you know play. We're not playing this season just to beat FAU. Mm-hmm. And now you go to Tennessee and another road environment. That's a really tough place to play in Knoxville. It, it just is. We've seen SEC teams just struggle there constantly. And um, and this is a team that's that's battle tested. I mean, they have they have the the fifth best strength of schedule in the country. And when you look at who they've played, I mean, they've played the likes of Wisconsin. I mean, they look at Wisconsin right now. This is a team that beat Wisconsin by 10 at the Kohl Center. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then you got you, – you've played Syracuse. You've played Purdue. You've played Kansas. You've played North Carolina. I mean, geez, I, they they have seen it all, and they're they're only – you know, they're only nine – this is their ninth game of the season. And and they play – they are so physical. And that's that's not – I'm not breaking any news. We, we know that's, that's how Tennessee plays. But if you're Tennessee – I said this a couple of weeks ago. I was like – Shoot, if I was Tennessee, I would I would absolutely be as physical as possible with this team to try to send them to the free throw line. Now you're like 18 for 20. Okay, they can they've showed that they can knock down some free throws. So, and I think you're still going to need to if you're Illinois. I think you're going to spend some time in the bonus in this game. Um, but it's just it's interesting seeing the the contrast. There's a couple teams, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about some Big Ten teams as well. But the contrast in, in Tennessee's style. They've just they've played you know high major opponents. They've been pretty up tempo offensively, which is not which is not common for them. They're 25th nationally offensively in tempo. Last year they were 246. Now defensively, they are still you know knock down, drag out, fight. Like you're going to have to to be disciplined, like we talk about, and try to still generate those those good looks. But I'm looking at Ziegler, who is a small guard. If you're Terrence Shannon, Marcus Damask, it's once again, can we go matchup hunting again? Mm-hmm. Can we can we find these matchups? If it Dalton connect, how's that ankle? Let's test it. Get him in ball screens. Go off the deck. You know, I there's there's ways to attack this team, but again, it just comes back to to being disciplined. You brought up Wisconsin since their back-to-back losses to Tennessee and Providence. They've won six straight, including Virginia, SMU on neutral site, uh, then Marquette at home. Really impressive win, one by eleven, and then Michigan State they won by thirteen. What do you make of that Badgers team? Feels like them and Illinois kind of putting themselves in that at least second tier of contenders that could maybe push or make Purdue sweat a little bit. Well, they're doing it in a slightly different way than they've done in in previous years. I think AJ Store was a really big pickup for them, and I'm not. I don't know what's going on with Connor season. I yeah. I don't know that to go to be 10 a game and all freshmen. And now you're playing like four total minutes in the last two games. That's maybe he's injured. I I, I have no idea. I don't, I don't want to speculate, but AJ store was such a big pickup because it felt like it's just, that's not the type of guy that they get. I feel like they haven't had a, like kind of a go-to scoring two guard since like Michael Finley. And, and uh, you know, and now you look at their, what they've done against high major teams, they have 10 plus offensive rebounds in every single high major game they've played. Hmm. All they had 20 against Virginia, Wisconsin, who is 330 plus in the country in offensive rebound last year. So maybe it's like a, it's a, 
more concerted effort to say, hey, let's let's we we know we we play a slower tempo, but let's still try to steal some offensively because now it's like you're hoping to be one and done with Wisconsin because of how much they 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 test you defensively with running using that shot clock, and now they're getting offensive rebounds and saying. <laughs> Kick it out. Let's run. Let's run it back. So you, there's there's times you're playing defense for 50 straight seconds against Wisconsin because they're getting more back. And then the last thing I'll mention about Wisconsin, they are turning teams over this year. They're turning teams over. Yeah. Klesmit and 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 Store like they're getting into passing lanes. They're getting into you, and that has not been a staple for for Wisconsin. Wisconsin's taking care of the ball over the years, and they're like 90th in the country this year in in taking care of the ball. But the flip side is they're getting more back on the defensive end. So man. And they're they've got skill offensively. Crowell can step out, and and he's he's a skilled big man. So, I, not a lot of people were high on Wisconsin. They had a disappointing finish to the year last year, but here they are again, like the yeah. Grim Reaper. That's right. Uh, it's way too early to be thinking about this, but we can do it. At Wisconsin, March second, home against Purdue, March fifth. That feels like it's going to be some some big games, and you finish the the Big Ten season at Iowa. Which team do you trust the most to bounce back? Michigan, which through a couple games felt like, oh, maybe this team is good because they got some talent. Maryland, I, I know they beat Penn State in overtime. That was not a very impressive game. Or Michigan State. Like Of those three teams, Michigan, Maryland, Michigan State, who do you think bounces back? Michigan, Maryland, and Michigan State. Yeah. If you threw Indiana in there, I know they're two and zero right now in, in conference. I, I would say Indiana because I think they what they do defensively. But I mean, I'll probably go Michigan State. Um, I you know how I felt about them going in. The yeah, season. you were very skeptical of them. They, I, they, I top five in the country was insane, and it, it probably did them a disservice too. You lost your best player, in Joey Hauser. I don't care what anyone says. Joey Hauser was the best player. Forty five percent from three, leading rebounder, floor spacer. You're a ball screen team. I, I've said it a million times before. He made AJ right. Hogard so much better, right? Yeah, and there's more space to operate for those guys, and Ty, Tyson Walker to operate in the mid in the mid range game. And but look, they were overrated. They'll they're eventually going to be underrated. Mm -hmm. That's that's just what's going to happen. Now, I said going into the year, could they shoot the ball well enough to you know because they shot well last year, and that helped in a lot of different areas. They didn't finish stuff around the rim very well. Uh, they were last in the conference in field goals around the rim. And the same things played out this year. They're just not shooting it well. And, you know, like defensively, I trust them more defensively than those other teams. So, I mean, Michigan is is horrendous defensively. They they really are. And teams are shooting almost 40% from three on them. And that's not just like, hey, teams are making shots on us. That tells me you can't guard off the dribble because that's, that's what's leading to more quality looks. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I expect Michigan State to bounce back. Yeah, they do this every year. You know, they'll they'll drop a few in non-conference, and then you'll underestimate them, and then you're like, oh, whoa, they might get a double buy for for the Big Ten tournament. We see them and the most dangerous seven seed in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, exactly. So, and then we'll overrate them again going into the next season. So, uh, yeah, I, I, Michigan State would be my team to to bounce back for sure. Yeah. What do you make of Indiana? Seven and one. They're two and zero in Big Ten play, Mike. I still, I still don't buy them, but Khalil Ware's been better than I expected. Like he, he's, he's really improved. I got to give Mike Woodson a lot of credit. And that front court's a bear. I just, I just don't know if they can have the guard play to, to really contend here. But they're a little better than I thought. No, they oh, are, and then their front court, their front court's really good. It yeah. is, and and Khalil Ware just coming into the season, the main thing was, is he going to play hard? Because the yeah. talent was always there. You know, he has, he's, he's really skilled as well. But what was Mike Woodson going to get out of him? Because Dana Altman was just kind of like, take him. Fine. That we, we don't want him anymore. And then maybe that lights a fire under a kid like that who was like a top 15 projected guy last year and has, has slid a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think you you look at Indiana, they've been solid defensively. Offensively, they just, they, they're they one of the worst three-point shooting teams in America. And part of that is point guard play. They just they can't generate enough good ones. But if they're bigs – end up forcing more double teams you know now maybe you're getting kickouts that lead to more high quality shots but you know they're, they're 22nd in the country in two point field goal percentage they're finishing around the rim um they've shot it relatively well from the free throw line i think they're they're 70 percent, but they're going to the free throw line a ton um like their percentage of free throw attempts to field goal attempts i think is is 12th nationally 
So they're they're getting there, and they they play a physical style uh, of basketball, and they're also just kind of abandoning the three, which is similar to Illinois is not abandoning it, but they just I think they're they they they're like 360th in the country. Indiana is in in three point attempt to field goal attempt. So they're starting to kind of figure out who they are, and I I don't think it's gonna I. They could end up being an NCAA tournament team, like a, a potentially like a nine-ish or yeah. a first four type of team. Um, but yeah, if if you don't have your front court in order, that that's a team that can give you give you some fits. And, and if you know Mike Woodson, he's going to have his team playing hard for sure. Well, this was fun, Mike. A huge game, huge win for Illinois. Two uh, feel good wins on the East Coast, and we'll see if they can go down south to Tennessee and get another one. Because Mike, if they win that one, they might be a top ten team in the country next week. I, I would, I would guess they would be. They would be for sure. Mike, too. Thanks as always, man. All right, man. Take care.